<laughs> Thanks very much. I know Mike Rawlins gave a description of where we are with UK Biobank um, this morning, and I'm sorry I wasn't there because uh, we were having our, our scientific advisory board meeting uh, yesterday and, and this morning. But I'm um, very pleased to have the opportunity to be here today. Um, so Jonathan Sellers will talk about uh, the uh, access procedures and the uh, experience over the last year with respect to access to the UK Biobank resource and the way in which we've learned from that. And um, uh, working with both funders and the EGC, we're looking at ways to, to, to streamline that um, uh, and to learn from, from other um, uh, resources. So what I'm going to talk about, though, is, is really what we're doing with respect to genotyping and how we've informed participants about um, what we're going to do. Um, so um, uh, as Mike uh, Rawlins will have told you, you know, obviously UK Biobank, half a million people aged 40 to 69 when they were recruited during 2006, 2010 from uh, England, Scotland, and Wales uh, with detailed questions, measurements, and biological samples. Uh, and um, within the consent, the opportunity to uh, recontact people and invite them back uh, for additional studies. Um, and uh, Sheila McGuinness mentioned the, the imaging study, which we're just piloting at the moment, uh, where we uh, plan to image 100,000 people. In the original uh, consent, um, amongst a number of uh, items, uh, we specifically asked for general consent for follow-up through all the health records, so linking to medical and other health-related records. So it referred to examples like education, employment records, um, uh, although we haven't made such linkages as yet, where we currently only have linked to uh, death, cancer, hospitalization, primary care. Um, for all types of health research, with no feedback to individuals of any of their results, and um, uh, there are a series of tick boxes in the consent form uh, that was done uh, at the assessment center on, um, on the computer, on the touch screen, and one of the questions um, was, uh, I understand that none of, my, none of my results were given to me except for some measurements during this visit, um, and they had to tick, I agree, if they wanted to be in the study. And um, obviously, we wanted to have sufficiently large numbers of people developing different conditions to assess causes reliably. Um, and that was why we had half a million people. And I think at the time that we set up the study, um, well, I know at the time that we set up the study, our expectation was that much of the assay of the samples uh, would be done in a nested case control way. So people who developed particular diseases, um, uh, where there are enough of them, we'd pull out their samples, pull out some match controls, and then genotyping and various assays would be, would be done on them. And that was certainly the, the, uh, the approach that was anticipated. Um, and, and we anticipated that with half a million people that we would have lots of different nested case control uh, samples that we, uh, uh, collections that we would be able to look at. So by 2012, at least once we've got linkage to 2012, there'll be 10,000 incident cases of diabetes, 7,000 coronary disease, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine there were lots of different nested case control collections um, and specific analyses would be done on those specific uh, cases and controls in order to keep the cost down. Um, but then... As we thought about this a bit more, and particularly when we were thinking about an open access resource, uh, the issue around the depletion of the resource became uh, increasingly um, important. And how did we make sure that um, uh, the, the, the depletable sample didn't get used up before the really interesting experiments came along as there were larger numbers of a, a wider range of, of different diseases? Um, and that initiated thinking about, well, were there some kind of biomarkers that would be relevant to lots of different diseases, um, such that uh, although you might do a nested case control study in coronary disease, um, someone else might come along and want to do the same assays um, in a nested case control study of stroke um, or peripheral artery disease, and there would be uh, a lot of overlapping uh, biomarkers. Uh, and that it would be much more efficient, if there were the funding, uh, to assay um, the standard markers um, in the baseline samples from all half a million participants. So it would be much more 
cost-effective way of increasing the usability of the resource for researchers as well, because instead of them having to find the funding to do the assays they wanted to do, if Biobank could uh, effectively coordinate on their be behalf to get those assays done, um, then for individual researchers, particularly researchers that, that are in working in diseases that are perhaps poorly funded, um, would be able to use the resource more readily. So it democratized the resource in some sense. Um, and of course, also, it meant that the assay results in the half million people could be used um, to identify a particularly interesting individual. So rather than just using the fact of developing disease to identify uh, cases and controls, one could use some of the biomarker measures to identify people, who, say, who are extremes of lipid values or, or, or other things that you would want to compare to see whether there were genetic determinants of, of lipids or, or other measures that could be in, important in understanding the determinants of disease. The other advantage, of course, in doing these assays um, in all of the participants at one time um, is that if you do a lipid measurement in 10,000 people here and then uh, another 10,000 here, the assay methods may be different, uh, the reagents may be different, and the results may not be comparable. Whereas by um, uh, taking the whole of the half million individuals and uh, um, effectively randomizing them so that you then do your assays in a random sequence, you get rid of any systematic bias. So you can't just take the people who were recruited in the first center and assay them, and then the next center and the next center, because there may well be systematic differences between the people in from the different centers. You know, people in Scotland may have higher lipids than people in London. Um, so we, we pull out the samples and, and uh, in a random order and analyze them in a random order. And the beauty of that is, not only are we can we use the standard quality assurance um, and quality control that one gets from the people who make the reagents, but we can use UK Biobank um, as quality control because we've got half a million people who are in a random order, so there should be no shift in any of the assays um, as we assay over time, uh, because the, the averages must be the same. Uh, so again, you can really improve the quality and therefore the comparability and improve uh, potentially the power of the study. And of course, if you're going to reagent makers and saying, I want to do five assays uh, or do 500,000 assays, you find you get a much better deal uh, with the latter. Uh, and that certainly turned out to be the case uh, with, with the genotyping. Um, uh, and I still think that it would be impossible to be doing the genotyping at the, the, the cost that we currently are doing it, um, even though we're kind of two years on since the, that deal was struck. Uh, so we were able to um, get uh, these data for the research community at very much lower cost. Uh, and as I say, get it for the whole research community, not just the well-funded research community. Um, and finally, where we started from, it makes it much easier for us to uh, manage the process and um, as Paul was indicating with respect to um, access, uh, it makes access much easier because we're not then arguing about whether the piece of research someone wants to do is going to use up a depletable sample because we've turned the sample into data and the threshold for releasing data is much lower. Um, and so you, we first started this discussion thinking about assays um, like lipid measurements, but it became clearer that in principle it would be um, uh, equally valuable for genotyping, although uh, at the time we were making this case, we, we still didn't think that was practical. Now, in terms of the genetic assays, um, you, this was clearly one part of uh, the whole rationale for UK Biobank, although um, uh, one of the major criticisms at Biobank at the, at the beginning was that it was presented as a to, by some, or interpreted as, uh, by some, as a genetic study. And, and one of the things that many of us had to do, Paul, myself, many others, was to explain to the people who said, you know, why would you recruit half a million people if all you're interested in genetics? It, is we had to say, we're not just interested in genetics, we're interested in gene, environment, interaction. Um, it is a standard, classical, uh, prospective co epidemiological co cohort where we will be measuring genetics among, with, uh, among many other uh, 
uh, things. But we were very clear um, that genetics was a large part of it. Um, and this is the kind of media coverage when the, the study was starting. You know, British research is set to begin the largest ever study of the genetic environmental causes of disease. Um, so uh, even before people were recruited, we made it very clear that um, DNA and DNA assay was at the heart of the study. In the information uh, provided to participants, um, in one part of that information, you know, why do you need my written consent? Um, uh, the underlining, just to, you, to, to say, give blood, saliva, and urine for long-term storage, and any testing, including obtaining genetic information, storing white blood cells so more DNA can be made. Whether we ever need to do that um, with the way technology has moved on, I don't know. Uh, we seem to be able to do an awful lot with, with very, very small amounts of uh, DNA from uh, the, the buffy coat, the white cells, um, rather than actually having to immortalize uh, the white cells and <clears throat> make more DNA. Um, and we made it clear to people that they were giving consent on a particular basis, um, but uh, if they felt that things occurred during the study that they hadn't anticipated, um, if their views changed or if their understanding changed or, if, as I say, the things that were the resource was being used for weren't what they uh, agreed with, they were, always, they were free to withdraw at, at any time. And one of, our, um, one of the points the Ethics and Governance Council have uh, made to us repeatedly and that we really um, agree with uh, is that in order to keep the consent um, alive, it's important that we inform the participants about what is going on. And um, Andrew Traherne and his team in communications um, uh, have been doing that and trying to make sure that participants know uh, what, what they signed up for and what they continue effectively to sign up for unless they uh, wish to withdraw. Um, and you, we've had very little in the way of withdrawal. So they can withdraw at three different levels. Um, keep my data, uh, keep on linking, but don't email me or write to me. Uh, um, don't use, uh, um, don't get any more linkage, um, or just destroy all of the data and all the samples. Um, and you can see the numbers out of half a million people, uh, despite uh, um, being told what's going on, or perhaps in spite uh, uh, because of being told what's going on, uh, people seem to be very comfortable uh, with the way in which UK Biobank is, is um, uh, being used. In terms of the genotyping, just to kind of uh, a couple of technical sides, what exactly are we doing? Um, uh, well, we're working with a company in California called Affymetrics. Um, they're measuring uh, 800,000 uh, markers. Um, about a quarter of a million of those markers um, are uh, for a whole genome um, array. So they're, they're largely um, not particularly informative about any disease, so they're just spread across the, the genome um, to look for associations with those areas of the genome uh, and, and various diseases or, or disease factors. Um, then there are uh, 200,000 markers that um, from other studies are known to be associated with risk factors or with disease or with, with other uh, kinds of um, genetic abnormality. Um, and then um, we have some more uh, um, exome sequence markers uh, that we hope will allow us to look at um, uh, lower frequency um, variants uh, to see whether they are associated with disease. Um, and this picture comes from um, Peter Donnelly, who from the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics in, in Oxford, who chaired the wor a working group of UK scientists to develop, in collaboration with Affymetrics, um, this chip uh, that would hopefully be as, uh, particularly informative about a range of different factors. And it's now uh, also being used in a number of other studies. So there'll be increasing amount of information, not only from UK Biobank, from, but from other studies, using the same array. Um, and it doesn't kind of stop there. And the, the thing about collaborating with geneticists is that everything is moving so rapidly. Um, but on the right-hand side of this graph, uh, I don't think I can see the spots. I doubt if you can. But 
over here, um, you, much of the GWAS has been about finding uh, relatively common variants, um, where at least 5% people have that allele, that variant, um, which have relatively small effects. Um, when one talks about the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium and particularly coronary disease, you know, you're talking about relative risks of you know, 1.3, 1.4, the, um, 1.5. For those who worked in kind of clinical genetics and the, um, uh, the, the fa family uh, directed studies, um, typically one's been looking for rare variants with big effects. Um, through linkage approaches, the kinds of things where uh, you, you might uh, be considering uh, feedback. So our GWAS part is really looking here, but the hope is that um, with some of the XM sequence uh, data, one can also look at these lower frequency uh, variants. But as I say, it doesn't stop with what you measure. Um, and uh, for those who are unfamiliar with this, this concept of imputation, um, where you take the knowledge that you can get from sequence data in a, um, uh, a standard population, say UK population, on five or 10 or 50,000 people, and you combine that with the measured genotype data, allows you to estimate or to impute um, additional genotypes that you haven't measured. So you know, if you've measured one particular variant, um, then the probability of the variance either side of that being particular flavor is very, very high based on the sequence data. And as you go further and further away from the ones you measure, the probabilities go down. But this imputation seems to be um, changing very rapidly. So when we started this project, the genetics team was saying, well, we're measuring 800,000. We'll be able to impute around, you know, probably about 2 million. About uh, six weeks ago, we had a meeting in the Gene Center um, and they said, no, it's now moved to 12 million. Yesterday, they said it's now 50 million. Um, uh, and so the, the level of imputation uh, and the ability to look at, um, at relatively rare variants, I'm not a geneticist, but relatively rare variants, which it is hoped might have um, somewhat more extreme effects than the, the things we've seen uh, hitherto, um, it, it, may change, and, and, and that, I think, is a very interesting um, uh, part of this whole area. And whether we get to the point where we don't even need to sequence, uh, we'll be able to impute so much uh, within UK Biobank, I think, is, um, is, is an interesting question. I, I don't know whether that's the way things will go. But coming back to informing the participants, um, uh, we uh, have a, um, uh, the website. We also have an annual newsletter. Uh, I think one of the things you need to bear in mind is you know, what works for a study of 5,000 people or so, like Framingham, um, may not work for half a million people. Um, we're not dealing with one small town in Massachusetts. We're dealing with you know, people spread across the whole of the UK and very large numbers of them. Um, but the newsletter is something that gets out to everybody. And um, uh, what we've found is that when we've drawn attention to the, the genotyping, we get a very positive uh, response and, and, and this is seen as a, as a step forward uh, that participants are keen about. Um, and um, in order to go beyond the newsletter, so that's encouraging people to look at the website, um, uh, Andrew has developed a number of uh, um, little podcasts that talk about the study being underway. Uh, that um, talk about understanding genetic research um, uh, and um, uh, ensure that the participants know what's happening. And also, every study that is approved for use um, is listed on the, the website with the lay summaries uh, that Sheila mentioned in, in her presentation um, uh, so that they can understand what, what is, the uh, participants can understand what's, what's happening. So finally, in terms of where we are on our genotyping project, because we've not released any data, um, uh, we've been extracting the DNA. Uh, we've got people working 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, to do that. Um, so they're extracting uh, 6,500 samples per week at the moment. Um, the DNA then shipped to Affymetrix in California for genotyping. Um, half a million have been genotyped already uh, with uh, kind of 
the technical stuff of pass rate and call rate uh, essentially means very high quality data. Um, and um, the genotyping data for the first 150,000 participants have now gone back to the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics in Oxford. They're having their quality control um, uh, completed on all of that. Um, and those first 150,000 uh, will be available for approved researchers um, who have had their research studies uh, reviewed and approved by the EXA subcommittee um, by the end of the 2014. We will then um, be releasing all half million um, in the third quarter of next year. Uh, and we then hope during 2016 to uh, be able to release the imputed data um, on Lord knows how many million by that time, um, uh, but at least 50 million uh, imputed um, on the, the 500,000 individuals. So uh, that's where we are with um, UK Biobank.